And this evening, the discussion is going to be the Vimla Kirti Nirdesha Sutra. And we're looking specifically at chapter, chapter three, the disciples. And I chose to not spend a long time talking about this this evening so that you can ask some questions, um, since it's not always absolutely clear um, what the subject matter might be. And I wanted to give a little bit of background since it's always several months between the time that I do another chapter on the Vimala Kirti Sutra. The first one was in November. And the Vimala Kirti Sutra focuses on a lay person who has exceeded the spiritual prowess of almost all of Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples and bodhisattvas. And Vimala Kirti is pretending to be sick in bed to attract an audience of visitors who've come to wish him well and inquire about his health. And I imagine that what you see on the picture on the right-hand side is the image of Vimala Kirti uh, in his bed. The sutra reaches its climax when Vimala Kirti asks his audience of bodhisattvas to describe the nature of non-duality. And a couple of important points that we should make about this sutra. And the first point is that the sutra is, is that awakening does not depend on ordination. Further, that upaya, skillful means, is used to teach that nirvana and samsara at an ultimate level or the absolute level are not different. And finally, Vimala Kirti asserts that a bodhisattva is able to live in the world engaging it fully, even to the point of partaking in its pleasures, passions, and defilements without being attached by them or corrupted by them. This last point, actually several of the points here, uh, is sort of a rebuff to the arhats of the Shravakiana, today's Theravada, who are ordained Sangha living monastic lives. And this Sutra makes the point that bodhisattvas can be both ordained and lay members, and without giving away the plot totally, we'll find out in a later chapter that Vimala Kirti was a heavenly bodhisattva in a previous lifetime. But in this lifetime, he's a rich merchant uh, who, whose powers are really incredible. I have to let someone else in here. Okay. The narratives thus far, and again, people, uh, we don't present this every week. It's not a, a series that's uh, on, it's a series that's ongoing, but it's not sequential. So it's been a few months since we saw the last uh, chapter. So I wanna just give people a chance to catch up a little bit and refresh your memory because it's important. The first chapter of the sutra is called the Buddha Lands and addresses the nature of the Buddha fields which is exemplified by the quote in this chapter, the Buddha said to jeweled accumulation, it is by inducing the various living beings to enter into Buddha wisdom in such and such land that they acquire their Buddha lands. It is by inducing the various living beings to develop the capacity for bodhisattva practice in such and such a land that they acquire their Buddha lands. Why is this? Because the bodhisattva's acquisition of pure land is wholly due to his having brought benefit to living beings. This had a profound influence on Pure Land teachings in China and later in Japan. This basic teaching has implications beyond what we see directly before us. And that is that we are not separate from the Buddha field. We are part of the Buddha field. Chapter two introduced the main character, namely Vimala Kirti, after which this, the title, the sutra is titled. It's a short chapter providing us with a portrait of Vimala Kirti and introducing upaya and skillful means, which upaya is skillful means, which is one of the major plot points of the sutra as evidenced by this brief narrative. At that time, and this is a quote, out of the very skill in liberating technique manifested himself as if sick to inquire after his health, the king, the officials, the lords, the youths, the aristocrats, the householders, the businessmen and town folk, the country folk and thousands of other living beings came forth from the great city of Vaishali and called on the invalid. When they arrived, Vimala Kirti taught them the Dharma. 
beginning his discourse with the actuality of the four main elements or the four noble truths. The Dharma he is teaching is that of non-attachment. He concludes a soliloquy by stating, good people, if you wish to gain the Buddha body and do away with the ills that afflict all living beings, then you must set your minds on attaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, unexcelled absolute awakening. Chapter three, which is of the disciples. Having left the last chapter with Vimalakirti attracting people from around the kingdom to visit him in a sickbed in order to hear the Dharma, he starts this chapter, the disciples, with the following. At the time, the rich man, Vimalakirti, thought to himself, I am lying here sick in bed. Why does the world honored one in his great compassion fail to show some concern for me? And of course, here the world honored one, Shakyamuni Buddha. The Buddha, aware of this thought, said to Shariputra, you must go visit Vimalakirti and inquire about his illness. But Shariputra replied to the Buddha in these words, world honored one, I am not competent to visit him and inquire about his illness. Why? Because I recall one occasion in the past when I was sitting in the quiet meditation under a tree in the forest. At that time, Vimalakirti approached me and said to me, Shariputra, you should not assume that this sort of sitting is true quiet sitting. Quiet sitting means that in this threefold world, you manifest neither body nor will. This is quiet sitting, not rising out of your samadhi of complete cessation and yet showing yourself in the ceremonies of daily life. This is quiet sitting, not abandoning the principles of the way and yet showing yourself in the activities of common mortal. This is quiet sitting. Your mind not fixed on internal things and yet not engaged with externals either. This is quiet sitting. Unmoved by sundry theories, but practicing the 37 elements of the way. This is quiet sitting. Entering nirvana without having put an end to earthly de desires. This is quiet sitting. If you can do this kind of sitting, you will merit the Buddha's seal of approval. At that time, world honored one, when I heard him speak these words, I remained silent for I had no way to reply to them. And that is why I'm not competent to visit him and inquire about his illness. And by the way, that's Shariputra's image that is in the uh, picture to the right. The Buddha then said to Mad <coughs> Madhulayana, you must go to visit Vimala Kirti and inquire about his illness. But Madhulayana, replied to the Buddha, world honored one, I am not competent to visit him and inquire about his illness. Why? Because I recall how in the past I entered the great city of Vashali and its streets and lanes expanded the Dharma for the lay believers. The text continues in this fashion for Mughal Yayana and eight additional disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha. Thus in each of the 10 chief disciples of the Buddha dressed and addressed and each rejects Buddha's entreaty to visit Vimala Kirti. Each one of the disciples has been rebuffed by Vimala Kirti and thus there are 10 lessons given by a lay disciple of the Buddha in his ordinary ordained disciples. Each of these lessons is a significant Dharma teaching. And you can see in the first one with Shariputra that the lesson had to do with what is the nature of quiet sitting. And for many people, depending upon the school of Buddhism that you might be most um, familiar with, the idea of quiet, quiet sitting as it, was drive, as it was described is probably something of a shock. But who are the disciples? The sutra doesn't tell us this. You can read that chapter, but you would have to go digging to find the 10 disciples. And as we've already heard, the first disciple the Shariputra, who's known as foremost in wisdom. The second disciple, Modgalyayana, is associated with meditation. He's also one of Shakyamuni Buddha's closest disciples, along with Shariputra. He is the protagonist with his mother in the Olabana Sutra, which led to the Oroban Ghost Festival in China, or Oban in Japan. 
Maha Kashapya, an enlightened disciple and foremost in aesthetic practices, he assumed the leadership of the Sangha after the shock of Shakyamuni Buddha's death and presided over the first Buddhist council. Sabhuti in Mahayana Buddhism is considered the foremost in understanding emptiness, shunyata, one of the major figures in the Prajnaparamita Sutras. His talents are described differently in the Pali Canon because you don't find the notion of shunyata to be as relevant to the Shravakayana as it is to the Mahayana. And we have Purna, Maitrayana Putra, considered to be one of the greatest teachers of Dharma and known as the great preacher. Katyayana is one of the four disciples to understand the Buddha's intentions in his sermons about the burning house that we see in the Lotus Sutra. And he fully understands the idea of the one round or complete teaching, Ekayana. And there's also Aniruddha, who is considered to be a master of clairvoyance and the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness, Smirti Pastatana. The eighth is Upali, mainly responsible for reciting and reviewing monastic discipline, Vinaya, on the first Buddhist council, which took place shortly after Shakyamuni Buddha's death. Of some interest, he was also one of the few of Buddha's disciples who was born to a low caste, not one of the Kshatriyas or Brahmins, as are most of the other people who were the chief disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha. And we have Ra Raula, who's best known as Siddhartha Gautama's son and became his attendant when he, after he joined the, the Sangha. And Ra Raula is known in Buddhist texts for his eagerness in learning and was honored by novice monks and nuns throughout Buddhist history. And finally, we have Ananda, who was Buddha's primary attendant. Most of the texts of the early Buddhist Sutra Pitaka are attributed to his collection of the Buddha's teachings during the first Buddhist council. He is reportedly to have had an eidetic memory and memorized all of the discourses of Shakyamuni Buddha, which is why he's considered to be the person who passed on the Sutra Pitaka. The major ideas from the chapter on disciples. Each of these set out in the sutra as a whole, and they're either touched on, introduced, or exemplified through simile or allegory in this chapter. And I'll list them without going into detail, encouraging you to read the chapter to see how they're treated. The first is the world as a pure land. The second, contemplation off the cushion. Third, controlling monkey mind. Fourth is integration of practice into daily life. Fifth is non-duality. Sixth is practices of the bodhisattva. And the seventh being receptive to other traditions. And I think that many sutras do not provide this wide variety of activities that are found. Uh, and these activities are pretty much found in all of the examples given in chapter three although later on they may go into more detail. So for instance, um, controlling monkey mind. Controlling monkey mind is, means to not to allow your mind to wander, not to allow your, your emotions to take over, to be in control of your mind. And this is one of the really important points that Vimala Kirti makes in his, in his uh, discourses, keeping in mind that as a bodhisattva, as someone who is a lay person, he would have been given much more opportunity to allow his mind to wander here and there, but somehow he maintained it. And I'm going to finish the chapter on disciples with a very simple ending, which is the last couple of sentences or last sentence actually in the chapter. Thus all 500 of the major disciples one by one described to the Buddha some early experiences of the words that Vimla Kirti had spoken on that occasion, each declaring, I am not competent to visit him and ask about his illness. 
Chapter four is titled the Bodhisattvas and begins as you might expect. The Buddha then said to Bodhisattva Maitreya, you must go forth to visit Vimala Kirti and ask about his illness. And so we go on with further teachings that are based upon the inadequacy of each of the Bodhisattvas, except one. Ah, I better not tell you. I got to leave something that's a little bit adventurous. So tune in for the next adventurous of Vimala Kirti Sutra to see who, who actually went to see Vimala Kirti. <laughs> in conclusion, this chapter is important in several ways. It emphasizes the role of the lay person in Mahayana Buddhism directly and without excuses. One might argue that Vimla Kirti is discourteous to Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples who are deserving of great respect. The point is thus much more convincingly made that lay people are equally capable of obtaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi as an ordinary person. We see in Jiki's Mashikan, reference is made to this chapter because the points made, such as the ones of the major ideas from the chapter, are expressed concisely. We should also be aware of the humor and the dramatic irony. It is found not only in this chapter, but throughout the work. It should be mentioned here that sudden teachings of Chinese Cha'an schools are largely based on the Vimala, Vimala Kirti Sutra. Finally, I see an interesting interplay between the elements of the Lotus Sutra the Prajnaparamita Sutras, the Parinirvana Sutra, and to a lesser extent with the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Ornament Sutra. There's an interesting side note. It's estimated that the sutra was written sometime in the first century CE in India. The characters are Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples or heavenly bodhisattvas, who are, of course, from the Indian subcontinent. But when I visualize Vimala Kirti, he appears Chinese to me. I can see how the Chinese would have been appreciative of this sutra and embraced it both for its philosophical profundity, but also in the manner that it portrays the individuals and the humor that is displayed. In my humble opinion, one cannot claim to know the Mahayana without reading and revisiting the Vimala Kirti Sutra. And these are the primary sources I used for the talk this evening. And the translation that I typically use is the one by Burton Watson. Um, Thurman's is, Thurman also has a very good one, as well as Cleary's. Um, Watson might be a little bit more readable. Thurman's is a little bit more academic. And Cleary's, he takes a little bit, of, a little bit more liberty in how he portrays the material. And now I'm going to unmute everyone to give you an opportunity to ask questions, make comments, or provide your thoughts. Um, I, I have one question. Yes. Um, is, is this sutra favored by particular sects of Buddhism over others, particular Mahayana sects, or is it a universally beloved Mahayana Sutra? Well, I, I would have to say that it's that it's pretty beloved of Mahayana um, participants in general. I think that, as I mentioned, Cha'an, Chinese Cha'an, which became Japanese Zen, they put a lot of a lot of store in it. And you find the Vimala Kirti Sutra sort of grouped with the Lotus Sutra and with the uh, Mahaparabha Nirvana Sutra, uh, especially those. Um, Hishima Sensei, you might have a different different view of that. Well, the uh, I just uh, uh, found uh, my friend Robert Thurman. Mm -hmm. He translated the holy teaching of Vimara Kirti, a Mahayana scripture, uh, as you have, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is quite interesting to see uh, the integration of uh, wisdom and uh, uh, skillful means. And in his page uh, eight, he says, uh, the description of Vimara Kirti as first in the esoteric practices, the description of the family of the Tathagatas, 
remarkability was identifying wisdom as a mother and the liberative technique as the father. And uh, uh, page 67, that is uh, chapter eight, the family of the Tathagata, uh, it says of the true Bodhisattvas, the mother is a, dis a transcendence of wisdom. The father is a skill in liberative technique. The leaders are born of such parents. I think this part is quite interesting uh, to understand Mahayana Buddhism and the GE or Tendai, uh, you know, predecessors, they use this uh, Bimarakirti Sutra very highly. And uh, the maybe founder of Japanese Buddhism, uh, Shotoku Taishi, Prince Shotoku, uh, he commented three major Mahayana texts uh, such as uh, the Roda Sutra and Bimarakirti Sutra and Shomango, Sri Mara uh, Devi Sutra. So these three uh, are basis of Japanese uh, Buddhism. And the 200 late, uh, years later, after uh, Sh uh, Shotoku Taishi, Prince Shotoku, Dengyo Daishi Saicho appeared. He said, well, uh, our predecessor, uh, <coughs> Shotoku, Prince Shotoku, already, already uh, planted the seed of the Lotus Sutra. Now this is a uh, harvest season to spread the Lotus Sutra uh, when he establishes Japanese Tendai Buddhism at Mount Hiei. So uh, Bhimarakirti is a very, uh, this sutra is very important for uh, founding J Tendai Buddhism uh, in China, as well as in Japan, I think. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 th I think to, to answer Maynard's question a little bit further, it's also widely revered in the Pure Land. Um, mm, that's right. Both Pure Land schools in Japan as well as Pure Land in China because of its reference to the Pure Land and the Buddha lands that you see. Uh, so mm. it, it's since the Pure Land schools in China and Japan are by far the largest schools, it has had quite, a, quite a, uh, an impact. Yeah. Thank you, Maynard. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Gary. Uh, stylistically, um, how, how many sutras use these upper level bodhisattvas as sort of Fall guys, <laughs> <laughs> straw, straw. Yeah, they're, they're they're sort of straw men, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is yeah. that a, that has to be a, a narrative uh, device? And I'm just wondering how common it is. How often we see it? Well, yeah. you see, you see, Shariputra used quite often. Yeah, he will ask a question, and then there's a response, and often the response is such. Well, they they don't say Shariputra, you dummy. But they'll say, they'll say something to indicate, hey, why didn't you figure this out? <laughs> you know, right. uh, so you you do see it with Shariputra. You don't see it with all the other disciples to the same extent. Let alone the bodhisattvas. I mean, the oh. next chapter, he's the same thing is being done to their bodhisattvas. Right. Each bodhisattva says, no, I can't go because at the last time I saw him, he told me what a dummy I was, and you know, I'm just not going to. I'm not going to expose myself to that kind of abuse, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I, it's it's not used very often. I and I and I think that that's part of the humor. Yeah, to be honest with you. Okay. And that's also part of the dramatic irony. Yeah. Because you've got an individual, let's say, who's such an incredible ascetic, and yet here here uh, here like here is saying, "Boy, are you a slacker?" <laughs> you know, um, and there's a there's a, a lot of dramatic irony in that, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Job. Yeah. Uh, earlier, Monsin Sensei, you said uh, Vimala Kirti uh, to you is like uh, Chinese. Uh, to me, he's like my dear Jewish friends. <laughs> 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 and, and I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain. So one is a comment. Uh, one is a question. The other is a comment. 
um, I think I read this either in one of the writings by Nakamura Hajime, and the, I would like to hear this say uh, from uh, Ichima Sensei or Monshin Sensei, with I'm right, or or maybe Nakamura Hajime's student uh, Ueki san, who translated the. Uh, 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 this text from the San Sanskrit version to Japanese recently, that Vimalakirti, when he discusses it with each of the each of the the Buddha's uh, uh, or Shakyamuni's disciples, he's actually addressing each disciple's most specialized field. Yeah, right. Right. and in a way, he's showing that it's he. he they remind me of uh, my colleagues in the field of academia that they have cherished ideas, <laughs> but they don't want to put uh, ah. in the uh, the test of real life. Right? Ah. <laughs> and and Vimalakirti is showing right uh, that uh, that you have to test it in real life, mm -hmm. uh, but somehow they are afraid of entering into, uh, a, 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 into a real dialogue in the sense that, uh, you know, a, a dialogue with uh, Vimla uh, Vimla Kirti can transform their ideas. Uh, so they have the attachments to their own truths. And I, yes. I, I'm not sure whether that, that's the case. So I, I just wanted to hear from you about this. And then the other aspect that I wanted to highlight, so, so in that respect, it, it, it's very Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> questioning the assumptions, questioning the assumptions. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and what I see here is uh, irony or tragedy. They don't see the presence of the suffering of the, of the person. He is ill, unwell, but, but uh, the illness is almost uh, transparent to them. They don't recognize the presence of illness in front of them. Well, two, two things. Uh, to, 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 first of all, when you're talking about Hikijime, yes, that's exactly correct. That's why each of those 10 cases, when he's speaking to each of the 10 people, he's addressing their strength. And he's calling them to task because he's saying, you think you're so good at this, but in fact, you don't even realize the nature of what is good. You, you, you don't have an open mind. And, and so having an open mind is one of the lessons that, that you find throughout, throughout the sutra. And by the way, I know on good authority that Vimla Kirti talks like this. So <laughs> when you ask the question, you know, you know, he, Vimla Kirti taught me my half Torah. I've got to tell you. So, but I do, I still see him as Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> we have two hands raised. Uh, first is, is James and then, and then Chris. And then I saw Gary he had his hand up also. James, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a comment real quick that uh, had it not been for the Vimla Kirti, and I would almost call it its sequel, the Platform S Sutra. I don't. I don't think I would have stepped into Mahayana quite the way that I did. It. 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 It, it really feels like a sutra that kind of it brings you in, it extends out a hand, and it says, "Come on, come on." take a look at this and, and it and it presents all these things for you to see and ch chapter three is really when it begins to do that right. and it's just it coming from t t Theravada it just permanently changed the way that I looked at awakening the practice all of that it takes it takes all that oh, smashes it on the floor and then says look at that look at that you know and that's 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 kind of what i love about it is it takes everything that you've assumed so far and just throws it on the ground and says well what are you going to do about that now you know <laughs> yeah 
No, I agree. And, and, and you recognize, James, that he was being very critical of the Theravada path and specifically yes. addressing the Arhats when he was doing that. Because, in fact, at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, from a Theravada perspective, all of those disciples were Arhats. Right. Yes. So, you know, that that's that's that we don't lose that in in our understanding of the sutra. Thank you, James. Chris, you had your hand up. Chris, you're on mute. Yes, thank you. I want to thank you, uh, Paul, for assigning this sutra from Vimalakirti because about 37 years ago, Robert Thurman was a visiting professor at Wesley and where I was, and he would uh, teach his classes in this big booming voice. And, you know, it was very exciting and he was very, um, very charismatic. And he assigned Vimala Kirti, and I never did my homework uh, around that. <laughs> so all of these years later. <laughs> so I agree with James. And all of these many years later, you gave me the opportunity to assign it to some academy students, which meant I had to read it. And I really had to work hard to try to make sense of it. And I just feel like it just blew my mind. And thank you. And so I have a question. Um, sure. do you and, um, and by, by the, the way, uh, Chris, that's called karma. That <laughs> <laughs> you never, you never read Bob's <laughs> when Bob assigned it. So karma said you're going to have to do it later on. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, please. So my question is, um, when I hear you talk about um, Tendai soteriology. Uh, uh, and what, from what I've read about it, the capacity to see the conditional and the unconditional simultaneously in any exact moment, precise moment, is of the nature of enlightenment. And I wondered first if the, it seems that Vimala Kirti is a figure who must do that because he's engaging in things that would be really perilous and uh, for most of us. Um, you know, and without being able to be in the unconditional while being uh, deeply involved in all kinds of everyday activities that could easily generate karmic attack, attachments that mm -hmm. generate karma. And so uh, my question is, how do you relate it to, to Tendai? And also, um, uh, how uh, do, you, do how would this be taught to lay people in ways that doesn't give them this delusional sense that they could just do anything if they have the right mind, if, if they have kind of right mindedness? Well, I, I think that that one of the, the things that can that I don't want to use a condition, the term condition, because you're using the term condition. But one of the things that instructs us, I mean, maybe that's the best term, is that. Vimala Kirti is incredibly disciplined in what he does. When he talks about the bodhisattva being able to live in the samsaric world and even, ex even experience pleasures or pain in the samsaric world and still be a bodhisattva and, and, and work for the benefit of others, that's only because of the individual's non-attachment because of their discipline because of their practices. And so that's, I would say that that's what he's instructing us. You can do these things if you have the, the, the discipline and the practices, you know, and when you read item after item, when you go on in, in the other um, sutra, and, and, and by the way, in a later chapter, you find out that Vimala Kirti was Akshabaya, in a previous life, and he was reborn as Vimala Kirti to be able to teach this. And so Akshobaya is known as having incredible discipline and being uh, virya, um, forbearance as part of his very being, you know. So I, I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. And Gary, you had your hand up before. Just that all of this subsequent conversation has been very, very clear. I, that all of 
all of this really helps my initial question. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Does anybody else have some questions? Sensei, did you have anything to say about Vimla Kirti before we move on? Well, uh, 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 Professor Joe uh, uh, indicated that uh, a translation of uh, Vimla Kirti uh, from the original Sanskrit. This, so far as Sanskrit text concerned, uh, quite recently, uh, Taisho University uh, group, they found that sutra uh, in at the uh, uh, in Tibet, uh, and uh, uh, now you know uh, three commentaries by Prince Shotokus. This uh, <coughs> Rota Sutra also has the Sanskrit translation, uh, Sanskrit original, and. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, Shurimara Devi Sutra, also we have it, but uh, the uh, last one, Bimara Kirti, has been long missing that original uh, Sanskrit text. And so now uh, the Taisho University Comprehensive Study Group, they went to the uh, uh, Potala uh, in Tibet. They found that sutra. That was very exciting. And uh, based on that, uh, Sanskrit text, uh, uh, Mr. Weki, uh, disciple of the uh, Nakamura Hajime, he trans retranslated into easy Japanese from the original Sanskrit text. So it is quite amazing that uh, we have such whole set of Mahayana basic uh, text. We found it in, uh, we can see it them in original Sanskrit text. So this is a great thing, I think. And uh, of course, the uh, Robert Sermon translated from the Chinese, no, not Chinese, but the uh, Tibetan okay. text. Uh, this is a very uh, exciting one. I like it very much. That is my just comment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> why don't we move along? I thank everyone, unless someone has a final question or comment or thought to make about it. And we'll be doing another chapter of Imla Kirti uh, in a month or so. I don't, you know, we have a lot of things to talk about, so I try to space it out. Um, and it's it's fun. I mean, I just find the Vimla Kirti uh, Sutra fun, plain and simple. So it's, it's great to be able to present it. Um, let's move along. And what I'm going to do, if you were around the temple today, the temperature was about 21 degrees Celsius or seven degrees, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It was sunny. The lilac bush is now replete with bright green buds pushing through. And some of the trees have small red and green outgrowths that are seeking the sun and waiting for the rain, which will come tomorrow. And by the way, we're supposed to get several inches of snow Thursday night and Friday morning. But the temperatures won't drop that much, so all the foliage will be safe. And the daffodils are a dazzling yellow. This made me think of last year at this time because we were in the midst of sequestering, restaurants were closing, concerts were being canceled, commencement at colleges were, being, were projected to occur virtually, and the number of people becoming sick with COVID-19 and dying as a result was beginning to climb. We knew that we were in for a bad patch. And I remember thinking, maybe by the end of summer, we'll, we'll be out of it. We were quickly disabused of that notion. In spite of our wonderful springtime that was coming, around, coming out all around us, we had a foreboding and an anxiety of what was to come. And it came, and not only with the COVID pandemic, and the deaths that mounted daily, exceeding each day the number of people who died at the World Trade Center 20 years ago. There were the terrible incidents of white supremacy and terrorism that seemed to culminate in January 6th of this year. But this year we see, we see a glimmer of light on the horizon and many of us have been totally vaccinated and we feel semi-invincible. For the temple, we'll be having our first in-person meditation service in, I guess it's nine months or so, the beginning of May. 
And in spite of the more recent incidents of racial hatred against black, brown, and Asian people, at the same time, there is a countervailing force of a new political will that seems to be, exist in the minds of people more than some of the politicians in Washington. The combination of the spring bursting forth around us, a more positive attitude about where we're going, and a sense of gratitude and humility has led me to feel within my very being a sense of interpenetration of the life force residing in this bag of bones and the universe. The understanding of that interpenetration has assisted me this last year. And right now it's bursting forth like those lilac buds. Interpenetration is one of the shining characteristics of Mahayana Buddhism. Indeed, I feel it on a very fundamental level, rather like the quarks of which all matter is constituted, well, at least according to some of the physicists. During the dark days of this last year and the more promising times of the spring, I said to myself, don't people understand what we do to one person, we do to all? What we do to one sentient being, we do to all sentient beings. I know in talking to my friends in interfaith communities that the concept of interpenetration exists in most religious traditions at some level. It is one of the commonalities that we share in addition to generosity, humility, harmony, and service to others. I ask each one of you today to give serious contemplative thought as to how we might bind our Buddhist communities, our interfaith communities, and our nations together with a greater sense of interpenetration and interconnectedness. This interconnectedness seems like the secret that's been hidden in the hem of our garments while we go through our day-to-day -day existence. Like a friend in chapter eight of the Lotus Sutra, I am revealing to you the secret. Interpenetration is there. Take a deep breath and absorb its meaning. It is not only true and revealing, it is liberating. Svaha. Humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things connect. That was the great Bodhisattva, Chief Seattle, Duwamish.